I know a lot of uh, scientists do tests on rodents. Have you seen the results translate pretty well from rodents to humans? That's a great question, Sean. It really is something that we that I am always challenging myself with. I'm mindful of the limitations. So the closer you get, so you go from a, you know, I do mammal work. So we'll use mice, mm -hmm. which are a good model for genetic knockouts. Like if we want to try to understand how one particular protein influences metabolic processes, then we use mice. Otherwise, whenever I'm doing um, typical just kind of diet work where we want to get the animal fat and diabetic, mm. the rat is a great model and does appear to have a very similar um, response, including a hormone response that, that we see in humans oh, wow. based on human work. And again, I understand the ethics. I truly, truly do. But the pursuit of knowledge and truth and helping humans live longer, better lives, um, you, like I just mentioned the brain. Mm -hmm. We've done a lot of papers looking at how Alzheimer's disease um, is, is really a metabolic problem. That's not a problem of plaques in the brain. Mm. It really is just the brain is becoming more and more insulin resistant and as it becomes more insulin resistant, it can't get enough glucose from the blood to fuel itself. And so with insufficient fuel, brain function just turns down and dementia begins to result. Mind you, it's not just dementia. It's depression. It's bipolar disorders. It's migraine headaches. Wow. All of those have in common this phenomenon of brain glucose hypometabolism, where the brain just isn't metabolizing glucose well because it can't get it. Mm. But back to the rodents, we couldn't do that in humans. You couldn't get brain samples from a human to measure the mitochondrial bioenergetics right. and the insulin signaling. So to answer the question explicitly, there are limitations because they're clearly not humans, but it still gives us insight into how the human would respond, and it fits with some of the broader correlational data that we see mm. with humans. Yes, it's a huge, huge connection. So when I talk about insulin resistance, after I sort of define it and tee it up, which is, again, relevant because it's the most common health disorder worldwide, I then always transition into where does it come from. And there are three primary causes of insulin resistance, and I've mentioned two of them already. One is chronically elevated insulin. The more we are spiking our insulin up by eating or drinking refined starches and sugars, the more the body just starts to become resistant to the insulin. Mm. So too much insulin causes insulin resistance. The second is inflammation. When inflammation is dialed up, it begins to directly promote insulin resistance. And then sleep brings us to the third primary independent cause, which is stress. Mm. Now, most people don't think about stress when they think about poor sleep, but it is absolutely a stressor. One bad night of sleep, you wake up that next day and you are markedly, demonstrably more insulin resistant than you were the day before. Wow. And it's entirely because of the stress hormones. Now, when I talk about stress... I talk about it as a professor who teaches graduate endocrinology, which is stress is when the stress hormones are elevated. Mm. And the two primary stress hormones are cortisol and adrenaline. Both of those are increased after a poor night of sleep, especially cortisol. If you sleep poorly, your cortisol is substantially elevated that next day, mm. and then the cortisol directly causes insulin resistance. But Sean, to make it all the more tragic, most people who then have a bad night of sleep try to correct how they feel that next day by taking a lot of caffeine. Right. Caffeine increases adrenaline. <laughs> and so now they're having a further contributor to their insulin resistance, further just kind of compounding this problem. Wow. Whereas one bad night of sleep, the metabolic consequences can be corrected by one good night. The more this starts to spiral out of control where it's a bad night. Now my cortisol's up. Now I'm drinking a lot of caffeine. Now also my adrenaline is up. Mm. All of these things start spiraling together into a bit of a metabolic storm. Now the insulin resistance becomes much more insidious and one good night is not going to wipe it out. Crazy. That's when you really have to start changing these habits. And as a college professor, you see a lot of students that live like that. Oh like my that. gosh. Oh my gosh. Yes, I, I sure do. Yeah, <laughs> it's in fact, I shudder when I look at them and think, did I, was I ever this stupid? <laughs> you know, I they don't have know. no idea. No, they don't. No. And mind you, when you're young, you do, you are a little bulletproof. Um, it, you know, these kids really can shrug off a lot of these metabolic shots mm. and pretty well. Um, you know, for me, as I'm nearing 50, I can't shrug them off as well as I used to. But that brings me to my point, which is when you're going through, after you've come out of puberty, um, which these kids are, um, mm. the girls already have for a couple years by the time they start college. Some of these boys are not done puberty yet when they start college. It's, they've still got another year or two to go. But typically, that's going to set your habits. Right. 
So get out of break those habits. You know, you college kids listening as from a college professor, go to bed early, wake up early. Yeah, that's the key, and don't mess with alcohol. <laughs> it screws up your sleep. Um, even worse, there's a myth that alcohol helps you sleep better. The reality is you fall asleep faster, but then the rest of the night is is horrible. Yeah. Alcohol is terrible for sleep.